Hey everyone, thanks for coming in to look at uh, what may be one of your first of these silly, <laughs> sciencey, ridiculous videos. I don't know if they're ridiculous. Some students say they help uh, they help learn or practice or see extra examples. Anyway, this very first video uh, pertains to our review chapter in our textbook, and we call it review because hopefully, perhaps you've seen some of this before. So I'm going to go quickly. You can always pause, rewind, go back, look at the PDF versions of these uh, notes. But in any case, some uh, scientific uh, ideas, chemistry related. Uh, observations, qualitative versus quantitative. Qualitative is a quality. Uh, hard, soft, hot, fast, slow. But quantitative, quantity involves a number and a unit. So there's some kind of uh, numeric value and some letters in back describing some um, describing some unit that we're using to measure that quantity. I happen to know that kilograms is mass and degrees Celsius is temperature and milliliters is volume, etc. Also, another way to categorize observations is in the sense of extensive versus intensive. Extensive uh, does depend on how much you have. So mass depends on a small amount or a large amount. The volume is how much space it takes up, how much energy change you're referring to. Density, how compact is something. That does not depend on how much of the sample we have. So intensive means um, independent of the sample size. Doesn't matter how big or how small, to some degree, it's a little bit of a fib, but whatever. Uh, you know, and classically macroscopically speaking anyway. Um, almost always when we measure something we'll have a, a number describing that uh, or at least we could say some of our most useful measurements include a number and a unit and uh, the unit describes what we're measuring and the number describes how much of that we have. So here's one, the first of one of many what I call basic concepts. Um, some of our most useful measurements have a quantity and a unit and in chemistry at least we always measure all often measure some of the most important things we measure mass in grams in chemistry although in physics it's more useful as a kilogram temperature in kelvin or celsius doesn't matter we'll use both in chemistry quite a bit if you don't know kelvin we'll see it in a minute um, the number of particles called the mole we haven't talked about that at all yet in lecture or anything, but we should introduce it quickly and, and uh, soon. Oh, wait, that's redundant. <laughs> quickly and briefly. And the volume is how much space something's taking up in milliliter. Well, chemists use milliliters, which is one one thousandth of a liter. These basic fundamental quantities are sometimes hard to, de hard to define, hard to describe. For example, this is a kind of a philosophical thing. How would, I, how would you define time? Time is a very fundamental quantity, but it's actually very, very, very hard to define time. But we can define mass and volume and temperature and density as follows. I'll let you read through those. This is, quote, a review. And so uh, you probably knew that, this stuff in junior high. If you didn't, you better go back and review some ideas. Um, some of the metric, met, we always use the metric system. We'll never use the English system. Well, we can just for sake of illustration and being silly, but in the metric system we always use these most important uh, prefixes. Kilo is a thousand, milli is one one thousandth, so we'll have to know the milli and the kilo, sometimes a centi. So memorize those two yellow ones and that red one I've highlighted there. The other ones aren't so important. You'd probably, probably be told what a pico or a micro were if you needed them. In the metric system, we um, divide things by tens and thousands, which is kind of convenient. Imagine a little cube one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter called a cubic centimeter, one centimeter cubed, also defined as one milliliter, also called one cc. And that's, if I put uh, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, that's a liter. It's also called a cubic decimeter, or it's called 1,000 cubic centimeters. That's a basic volume in, in chemistry. Uncertainty, oh yeah. So whenever we measure something, there's always going to be some uncertainty. Some, some amount of that is unknown. Like, what is the true answer? 
Uh, but in any case, this leads us to a description of uncertainty uh, or something also called significant figures. We say that um, the last digit that we record or write down as a scientist has a little bit of uncertainty or unknowability to that, or we're not quite so sure about that last digit. Um, the amount or quantity has some degree of uncertainty. How close is our measurement to the true value? And sometimes we don't know the true value. Sometimes we have to fish around for that for some time. If I'm reading an analog scale, like in the old school chemistry laboratory, I might look at a burette with a, that's just a tall skinny piece of glass where I used to measure volume. And if I were to zoom in on that a little bit closer, although if you do, you'll notice there's a mistake or a inconsistency between uh, this thing over here and this thing over here. But if this is 20 and that's 21 and that's 22 and that's 23 and that's 24, the zero line must have been way up here somewhere. But I'm supposed to read at the bottom of the meniscus, and I can say for sure it's 21 point something. 20, I'm sorry, 20 point one something, but that last digit's a little bit uncertain, a little bit of a guess. This gives me four significant figures um, in my measurement. And in in math, I'm allowed to do this, but in chemistry and, and engineering and physics, you're not allowed to say that. You can't say there are as many zeros in back of that five as you want because we're just not quite so sure that that's exactly where that meniscus lies. Or if I was reading this analog scale with this little uh, macadamia nut, this uh, kitchen balance isn't very mm, precise. As far as I can tell, it's one point something, but I'd have to guess one point beyond what. But if I look at uh, this scale, I know it's 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.2 something. So this one gives me one more sig fig than this one does. Or, for example, and remember, you're always welcome to pause these videos if you don't want to see the answer right away. But uh, how long is this penny? Assuming this edge of the ruler is exactly at the beginning of the penny, which is debatable, then the other side of the penny comes to 1.5678. 1.8, uh, the last one's a guess, but I, at least I'm allowed to guess one beyond what's marked on the scale, on this analog scale. And my best answer, I believe, for this one is a, like 1.89. You couldn't say 1.8900000 or something like that. That'd be ridiculous. So this looks like this measurement has three sig figs. Here's one to fiddle with if you want. You could pause the video and take a stab at that meniscus. This is a picture I actually took of a liquid volume in a burette. Mm -hmm. So there's 36, there's 37. I'm pretty sure the bottom of the meniscus is... Let me scroll down. Oh yeah, P.S. By the way, you're supposed to look with your eyeball exactly at the level of the meniscus. If you looked from above or looked from below, you'd get a parallax error. I'm pretty sure that that line there is marked at 36.5. 0, 36.6 for sure, 0 right on the line. So I'm going to guess 35.5, guess what that is, I don't know. I'm going to say something like that. Oh, and you know that last digit is a little bit uncertain. Yeah, maybe 36.55, 36.59, I don't know, but just guessing. Again, that last digit is a little bit uncertain. By Usually it's a convention to say it's uncertain by one uh, digit. So this brings up the sig fig idea, right? How many digits am I reading? How many am I reporting? How many am I justified in carrying forward in a calculation? Oh yeah, by the way, accuracy and precision, they have uh, careful meanings, precise meanings in chemistry. If I were to take a shot at the answer and uh, my answers fall all over the place, that has no precision <laughs> or no accuracy. If I were to take a measurement and they all fall close to each other, that's nice because they're all precise, but they're not very accurate. If I were to find out later the answer was over here I was shooting for, then uh, I'm quite a ways. My answers are pretty pretty far away from my, my true answer. This is what I'm shooting for, correct? I'm shooting for repeated measurements of a value that fall close to each other and indeed fall close to the true value, which I may not know what the true value is while I'm shooting at it, but still. It is said that... Um, Precision and accuracy come from different types of errors. And honestly, I don't know if it's that important that you uh, know what these are, uh, memorize these, but it's interesting in future, if you take future chemistry classes, you might see those again. Some errors, errors, mistakes cannot be corrected. 
and some errors can be corrected if you uh, calibrate your things well and take careful measurements. Um, yeah. Here are some examples of sig figs. This one only has one sig fig, this has two sig figs, this has three sig figs, this has four sig figs, but remember you're not allowed to tack 0 .0000, 17.0000 on the end if you didn't measure it. Uh, all these are significant, five sig figs, six sig figs, seven sig figs. So you're saying, oh yeah, by the way, scientific notation does not add count four or against sig figs. You're saying, how could... Oh, you're saying, yeah, okay, I'm not allowed to tag zeros on the end of uh, uh, of a measured number, like I am in math. You can't do that in science. Mm, one reason is because the zeros may or may not be significant. Zeros in front of a small number, this is a rule, just take it as a given for now. Zeros in front of a small number used to measure to locate the decimal only, uh, they, they don't count as significant. So all these zeros are non-significant non digits. If a, zero is happen if a zero happens to be trapped in between digits, like this zero, or this zero, or this one, or this one, if they're trapped between um, non-zero digits, that means it is significant, because I measured it, 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 or estimated it, but beyond that I can't say. And I measured it, measured it, measured it, measured it, or estimated it, but beyond that I can't say. But these zeros are different. They're placed in front to say these are small numbers, but I'm not going to count them as significant. Don't ask me why, because this is a video, but don't even ask me why during a lecture. That's the rule. No, I'm kidding. You can ask me, but I'll say it's the rule. There are <laughs> several reasons for that, but you just got to trust me on this one. Uh, here's four sig figs on that one. Also, zeros in back of a small number, I'm sorry, zeros in back of a large number um, do not count either. Uh, these zeros do count here because I measured them, measured them, measured them, measured them, measured or estimated it, but I'm not seeing anything more than that because my machine could only go to the tenths, hundreds, thousandths place. If I don't mention the decimal, this one right here has, uh, this zero is not significant because I'm not saying that I measured it. Sounds ridiculous, I know. Uh, most texts do this. Uh, if you put a decimal in back of the zeros, that's saying I measured it, 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 or estimated it. But beyond that, I'm not certain. So this has a whole bunch of sig figs. This only has one sig fig. This has four sig figs. Depends on how you're measuring it, what you're measuring with, um, you know, etc. This one has one. These in back of the these in back of the small number do count because they're implying that I measured it or estimated it. But in front of the small number or in back of a big number like this one, or if I did not have this decimal here, that would only have one sig fig. That's so much fun. Let's try that some more. Just kidding. Uh, Non-significant zeros in back of a big number, in back of a big number, in back of a big number. But what if I really did want to say that I had uh, measured those? I'd either put a decimal there or I'd write it in scientific notation saying that I measured it to the ones place. Mm, one sig fig two sig figs, two sig, I'm sorry, three sig figs, one, two, three, one, two, three, two sig figs. So there's different ways to write it, different ways to describe it. Why do we care? Well, one reason why we care is when we do calculations, our calculator might spit out a big, nasty, irrational number, but in multiplication and division, we are only allowed to keep as many digits in our answer as the least number of digit significant figures as the one we were working with, or ones or ones we were working with, the items we were working with. This has two sig figs, this is limited to two sig figs. Even though this has four sig figs, this two sig figs limits my answer. Another example, two sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs, multiply, get a big number, but since this only has two sig figs, I'm forced to round to this, which is more usually written like this in scientific notation. Although, personally, I like to avoid scientific notation if I can avoid it. And the same is true of division. If I were to divide a 5 sig fig number with a 3 sig fig number, I have to round my answer to 3 sig figs. By the usual, usual rules of rounding, if that digit is 5 or larger, we round up. If it's 4 or less, we round down. Oddly, confusingly, multiplying and, I'm sorry, yeah, multiplying and dividing have a different rule from adding and subtracting. With adding and subtracting, it's curious, it's weird, because we can sometimes lose or gain sig figs. The rule is, I need to round my answer to the place 
that is the least precise of the items I'm working with. So if this goes to the hundredths place, I round to the hundredths place right here. I kind of leave that last part off. Interesting. I round it up. Adding and subtracting may sometimes lose or gain sig figs. Whichever factor goes to the largest place value describes where to, to the largest, yeah, that's true, to the largest place value, not the smallest place value. This one is, this one here only goes to the tenths place, so I'm supposed to round this to the tenths place, like that. Or if I'm subtracting these two numbers, this one goes to the ones place, so I'm supposed to round my answer to the ones decimal place. Crazy. Yeah, this is another can of worms. Let's see here. I should go a little bit further here. This gives rise to a whole other can of worms called dimensional analysis. When I was in high school, I had a, an entire semester-long course on dimensional analysis, and it actually uh, served me quite well. If you can analyze the dimensions or the units on some particular parameter, uh, in utilizing conversion factors, and such, it's um, it's a good way to analyze whether you're getting the right answer or not, or good evidence that you might or might not be. I'll have a couple of additional videos on dimensional analysis, like what if I wanted to estimate how much it would cost me to drive to LA from LA to New York? What would I need to know? Well, how far is it, right? And uh, what's the what's the gas mileage of my car typically? And how much is gas uh, a gallon right now? It's actually more than three. That's not quite that much. Depends where you get your gas, right? I'm sure on the trip from LA to New York, the gas prices would vary in any case. Um, so the distance is, um, I looked it up, Googled it, 27, 89 miles. Depends from where in LA and where in New York, I'm sure. And my car gets uh, 40 miles per gallon. And the cost of the fuel on the average may be 370 per gallon. Look how I did this. I put the miles on the bottom. But the get and the, I had uh, this use this um, 40 miles per gallon. 40 miles per gallon is an up, I wrote it upside down as a conversion factor. I'm converting miles into gallons, and then in the next one I put the gallons on the bottom, and the dollars in the top. Three dollars and seventy cents per one gallon of gas. So here the miles cancel and the gallons cancel, and voila. Uh, let's see, three sig figs. This has five sig figs. This has three sig figs. This has three sig figs. So I rounded my answer to three sig figs because I'm doing multiplication and division. So it's this one times this one times this one divided by this one gives me this one. Again, as I said, that's uh, that's a series of another long video, topic of another long video. We'll never use Fahrenheit as temperature on in chemistry, but just FYI, we will convert Celsius to Kelvin though. If I'm going from Celsius uh, to Kelvin, I add 273. If I'm going from Kelvin to Celsius, I subtract 273.15 if you want to be picky about it. Usually three sig figs is plenty, but sometimes you want more. So this is a this is a nice one to know. Oh wait, this one's yucky. I would scratch that out if I were you. But this one right here, we got to know that one. Uh, also, density you learn in junior high. Yeah, remember density is mass over volume. Now, the way in chemistry, it's almost always grams per milliliter, g per mL, gram per cubic centimeter, and that also can serve as a conversion factor if you want. Or you can take uh, a certain mass and a certain volume of this. It looks like a, some kind of a metal. A mineral, it says, a metal. Metals are pretty dense at 7, 8, 9 grams per milliliter. Water has a density of 1 gram per milliliter. That's very convenient. But you take the grams and divide by the milliliters. But if you want to use density as a conversion factor, you can do... They didn't do it. All oh, those idiots. Okay, well, anyway. They put the density here and the volume here and solve for the mass. This one times this one gives this one. How are you at algebra? I call it quick and dirty math, but that should be pretty simple, yeah? Uh, classification of matter, solid, liquid, gas, phases. Um, you've seen these cartoons, maybe? A gas has particles that are very far apart and spread to fill the entire volume of the container. Liquids are very much closer together, but they're sloshy and they can be, you know, poured and stuff. But as my water freezes into a solid, it becomes a nice crystal, and it's called ice, and has some kind of interesting uh, crystal structure to it. Yeah, we know about solids, liquids, and gases. If you don't know, man, I don't know where you've been living under a rock. But even if you're living under a rock, you'd still have some concept of what solids, liquids, and gases are.
Uh, homogeneous mixture, heterogeneous mixtures, uh, mixtures that are the same throughout, mixtures that are different throughout. So like, um, let's see, heterogeneous uh, salad dressing, um, pizza, uh, gerbils, uh, trees, homogeneous mixtures, uh, Mountain Dew, um, <laughs> let's see, uh, any beverage that you might drink is usually fairly homogeneous throughout. Um, a mixture of two metals is homogeneous throughout, probably. This is a bit debatable, but what scale are you looking at? At a very, very small scale, this definition, this utility of this homogeneous might break down. Uh, let's see, pure water, that's not even a mixture, that's a pure substance. Gasoline, that's a mixture, that's a homogeneous mixture of many different hydrocarbons. A jar of jelly beans, that's not uh, homogeneous, that's debatable. Because if, if they're different flavors, I don't know. Soil is not a homogeneous mixture, it has different parts to it in different areas. Copper metal is not a mixture either, it's a pure element. Speaking of pure elements, uh, we could think about the periodic table. Each element has its own uh, box on the periodic table, and there are examples of what we call atoms. Atoms are the smallest individual units, but there are several different kinds of atoms, called the elements. Elements can come together to make compounds, and uh, elements and compounds comprise what we call the pure substances. But the mixtures are uh, the same throughout or different throughout. Uh, I've seen all different kinds of uh, organizers to look at this. There's another one. Take a look at it sometime, if you would. We like to invoke these silly little cartoons to think about what the atoms or molecules will be looking like. Um, oh, geez, I'm going to skip that one for now. It pertains more to Chapter 1. Here's my cartoon of copper atoms. <laughs> look at all of them. There are millions and millions, un unimaginable, hard to count, in three dimensions. This might be an enhanced electron microscope picture of a surface of copper atoms. And here's a cartoon of a, a, probably a scanning, tun scanning tun tunneling microscope with a very small tip and the electrons or the electrical current kind of tunnels from the tip to the surface and uh, senses the atoms. It's an amazing invention. Um, oh yeah, here's some atoms. Some, uh, this is the element helium. I do these little cartoon motion lines and back to say these heliums are moving very, very fast in all directions, colliding with each other in the walls of the container. They're atoms. Here's atoms of argon. Notice argon is a larger atom than helium. As such, these might be moving, usually would be moving a little slower at the same temperature than the helium particles, helium atoms. There are a few elements that uh, are diatomic. They come hooked up in pairs of two. And you should start to memorize those H2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, O2, and N2. N2 happens to be a triple bond, O2 is a double bond, but all the rest of these are single bonds. So even in a pure sample of iodine, I have two iodine atoms hooked together in a bond. We haven't talked about bonds yet, but it's true. But those are still elements. But now compounds are put together in um, two or more different um, two or more different elements put together in some kind of bonding fashion. Here's H2O, that's water, carbon dioxide, CO2. Here's ammonia, NH3. Here's a, oh yeah, these are called space filling models where they actually touch each other and that's more more realistic than the ball and stick model where I put little sticks in between the atoms representing bonds, but still it's used frequently. Here's a simple sugar with some carbons in a ring and some oxygen thrown in there. Uh, so these are called compounds or molecules. Well, I should be more careful with that. <laughs> These compounds are called molecules, but not all, not all mole, not all compounds are molecules. They're also ionic compounds. Mm, okay, which box is an element? Which box is a compound? Which box has a cartoon of a mixture? What about this one? I think that's an element, isn't it? Just the single individual atoms floating around or stuck in crystals. What about this one? That looks like water, right? So that's a compound. Um, this one has a couple of atoms. This, this pink thing, they're separate when the green ones are together, but still if they're the same atom, then they're diatomic elements. And <clears throat> excuse me, this would be called a mixture of two a mixture of two elements. Yes. One element is a single atomic element and this is a diatomic element. 
And uh, this one over here looks like a mixture of two compounds with the um, carbon dioxide and ammonia, probably if you know anything about it, but well, maybe you don't. But it's good to think about the cartoons, what the cartoon might possibly represent. Uh, we're coming close to the end here, guys. I, I swear, I hope we are. Classification of matter, physical change, is something we can see or determine or 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 describe without without changing the chemical composition, including like boiling something or melting it or tearing it or filtering it. A chemical change or a chemical process or a chemical um, chemical property can be determined or described with, with a change in the substance. So if I burn something, uh, it definitely changes the chemical uh, composition, and that's called a chemical change. So matter, anything that has mass and takes up space. We already talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous. Um, pure substances can be broken down into elements and compounds. If I, whenever I think about an element, I think of, does it have its own box on the periodic table? If it does, it's an element. If it's more complicated than that, it's called a compound, some kind of combination of those elements. Uh, so what about crushing a rock? Is that a physical or chemical change? Crushing it, simply crushing it, physical. Burning wood, chemical. Dissolving sugar in water, water dissolves something. It seems like it could be chemical, but no, dissolving is only a physical change. Melting a popsicle on a warm summer day, yeah, that's physical, that's not chemical. Here's a physical change. And I could separate water from anything else that was dissolved in the water, that whatever else was dissolved in the water would stay behind. And it's called distillation, to separate the water from the stuff that's to here. It doesn't show that it, there isn't anything dissolved, but the liquid water is closer together and the, and the gaseous water is further apart. But still, I have H2O and I have H2O. Here's a nail rusting. Rusting and burning are common examples of what we call redox reactions or chemical changes. Here's a pure iron nail. But here's the iron oxide. The, the iron combines with water vapor and oxygen in the air. Here's a tough question. Maybe you can pause and ask yourself if you know the answer. Uh, when iron in a nail rusts and combines with oxygen in the air, uh, water, water also helps the process. You get oh, what we call iron oxide. Um, what would happen to the mass of the nail? Do, 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 do. Just kidding. All right, so the answer is, um, believe it or not, uh, the nail would become more massive. It's weird because the, the rust is more flaky and uh, less dense than the iron itself and not as useful. And that's why the iron bridges and cars rust away and, and fall apart. But as a matter of fact, if I'm combining oxygen atoms with the iron atoms, then they would actually get more massive. So the uh, rusted nail would be more massive than the original nail, even though it's more brittle and less useful. And I kind of gave the answer to this one already, didn't I? What's the reason why the nail would weigh more? The rust contains iron atoms and oxygen atoms. If I had a billion billion iron atoms, I would have a billion billion plus something more than that oxygen combined with it, so that would weigh more. Again, a recap of uh, and basic concepts. I mean, this is I call this a review, but maybe you don't know it. Maybe you got to think about it. Physical change, physical property, does not change the chemistry or the bonding or what the substance is. But a chemical change or a chemical property does change what uh, what the substance is and uh, and uh, what the bonding is. Here's a long question. Maybe I should leave that for you. Hmm. Should I leave that for you? Maybe I'll leave that for you. I have a... Because you're getting tired of listening to this video. Here's a verbal description that would probably help you answer that question. Not a verbal. Here's a pictorial model of what would help, me, help you. Sometimes in chemistry, we this little we say we heat something up. And this one is if you heat it up, it uh, changes. But if... Uh, okay, I'll just leave that for you. You know what? I'm going to leave this one for you as well. So voila! I think that's uh, I think that's all I want to do for today. Uh, there's plenty of stuff to chew on there. Go back and look at the PDF of this. Lord knows you probably don't want to watch this video again. But in any case, thanks for checking in, and I admire your dedication already. Keep up good work.